Welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast from madsingers.com, where entrepreneurs and business managers learn and share. If you like the show, don't forget to leave a review. Hello, and welcome to this next episode of the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Today, I have with me Melinda Bailey. And uh, I probably slaughtered your name again, Melinda, but sorry about that. Uh, you probably did better with mine than I would do with yours. Fair enough. Fair enough. How are you today? I'm doing well. And yourself? I am excellent. I'm excited for this interview. Same. So, uh, Melinda, uh, as usual, some people around this club might not know about you. Would you mind giving people a brief look at who is Melinda and your background and so on? Happy to. Uh, in fact, I would be shocked if everyone around the world knew my name. Uh, as, as you learned, I, my name is Melinda Byerly. I currently live in San Francisco, where I have lived for the last 20 years, approximately. Um, I have been working in technology the entire time. I started out at eBay. I worked for Checkpoint Software, PayPal, Linden Lab, which created Second Life. I also um, was the head of virtual currency, virtual goods. I've worked for a number of startups, and I now have my own consultancy called Timeshare CMO, the last five years, we've been a location independent agency serving uh, companies of all sizes. Prior to working in technology, I actually have a theater degree. This is a little known fact about me. And I worked in the entertainment industry for almost 10 years before I went back to business school. So I've lived in several parts of the United States. So that gives me some insight into sort of um, how different people in different parts of this enormous country think. Excellent. Well, that sounds like a very exciting and very broad uh, experience. So that's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, Melinda, first of all, what, what is your management philosophy? When you think management, when you're looking, for example, when you're looking at starting your own company and so on, how, how do you generally think about management from a high-level perspective? Well, I think it's two parts. One is, obviously, you have to grow the business. Otherwise, it's not a business. So, what are the business results that you get? But also, at the same time, how are, are you building something that you can be proud of in terms of a culture that, that allows people to be excited about what they're doing, enables them? I believe the whole purpose of management and leadership is to bring out the potential of everyone on the team. I, I love that. And, and I, it, it's probably from a coaching standpoint, it's probably one of the things I work most with people on because they're so used to it being about them, being about what they do and being about their performance. And I totally agree with the management view, right? Like my, as soon as you start managing people, my philosophy is it stops being about you and starts being about the team, right? And indeed. I think that's, indeed. And, that, and the yeah. higher up you go, the more, you, more of your time you spend, you know, managing other people because you're not doing the work, if you will. You're not doing the, the hands-on execution. Your job is, is to facilitate the creation of that work. Definitely. And uh, I, I believe you run a location independent company now. Is that correct? I do. I started the company with my co-founder uh, more than five years ago. And from the beginning, because we were located on opposite coasts of the United States, we were location independent, virtual, remote, pick your term. But we started, we started out that way. And five years later, 16 people later, we're still entirely location independent. And, and how have you found that compared to being in a sort of office environment type thing? What, what, how do you see that being different and what have been some of the surprises you've had by running a business that way? Well, quite frankly, it's awesome. <laughs> um, now, that depends on what your experience was like in an office. So I have people say to me all the time, I could never do that. I can never work um, entirely remotely. I like the socializing in the office. I like all of the sort of, you know, things that go with being in an office. Um, maybe they need to get out of their house. They don't feel they can concentrate or focus. Whatever their reasons are, I think a lot of what you like or don't like about working um, remotely is really sort of within you and sort of your own preferences. But for me personally, this was a, a huge improvement over working inside of tech companies in the Bay Area for a number of reasons. Um, one is high distraction factor in the office. Um, be, not being able to focus in open plans. I have um, attention deficit disorder. I've had it since I was a child. And I found it very difficult to stay focused, um, you know, in a, in a room with constant interruptions, lack of control over schedule, meetings that felt unnecessary or, or you know, for show, a lot of, lot of, you know, ego around. So one of the things I think that surprised me the most, I think I knew I would appreciate, you know, having the, the, the privacy and the, and the quiet to sort of get things done. But I think the thing that surprised me the most was how few politics we have inside of a company that's remote. 
And I think, you know, I, I think some of it is because we don't sit in an office together eight hours a day. Um, we don't see everybody's foibles and everybody's little things that they do that are going to annoy each other. Like everybody can be their best self when we do interact. And so the times when we are in person are super precious and they're joyful and they're fun and people look forward to them. Not, ugh, I have to go to another offsite with these people I see 40, yeah. 50 hours a week. Okay. That sounds super. That sounds super. I mean, I've, I've been in a similar state. So I used to work corporate as well with like Xerox and IBM and big, big corporate giants. And, and uh, I probably the last four or five years, I've also run sort of location independent. Uh, the way I do it is totally exactly what you said is I, I definitely need a workspace. Like I've tried the thing with sitting, working in the living room and stuff, and that does not work for me, but, but everywhere I live, I, I try and make sure I have a room that's literally an office because else I can't probably focus and concentrate. But as soon as I have that, I'm uh, just like yourself. I'm, I'm super happy from working uh, at home most of the time, right? And meeting people maybe more rare, but you have much better times, as you said, when you actually meet people and it's much more valuable. So, It is. And, and, and I do agree with you that one of the key um, ways that, that our team, we did a series of posts on how to be successful and we solicited it because there are so many different work styles. Um, so if different people have different rules to be successful, but what people have in common is that there is a dedicated workspace and there, and it may not be an office per se. For example, I actually, my, my husband and I work out of a one bedroom apartment and he works remotely too for a completely different company. And so we have clear boundaries about when people are working and how to know when each other is working. We talk about who will take the call in the bedroom, you know, when they have a podcast to record at 5 PM so that the other one can make their dinner. Um, and, you know, if there's an important call that one of us needs privacy for, then we make space for it. And you just get really good at communicating boundaries. And, yep. um, and but again, your brain knows when it has a place to go and sit and work, it, it immediately snaps into work mode the minute I sit down at my desk. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that totally makes sense. I think, uh, like me and my partner, we actually have a room with two office desks and so on. But one of the challenges I do have is that I am, either on podcasts, webinars, and mm -hmm. coaching calls. And so, so I'm on the, on the phone, if you will, or on the, on the microphone at least uh, a lot of the time, right? So that it, it, I could definitely find it difficult if my partner was doing something similar. I could definitely find that a little bit difficult, but I totally get what you mean. Well stated. My partner actually listens on calls more than he has to talk, and it's the same way. I feel yeah. bad for him. I'm like, you had to listen to me give the same talk five hours in a row. <laughs> like if it's a pitch, right? If it's a consulting pitch, he's hearing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. So yes, fair, fair enough. Definitely, definitely. Interesting. That's very good. And I, and I think, I, I mean, it's growing big time, right? So I actually, one of my good friends uh, run, a, run a big website called dynamitejobs.co which mm -hmm. is basically a job specifically for location independent people. And uh, like the growth of, you can see in that, like how many people are looking for it mm -hmm. and how many companies are actually offering it is so interesting. And I mean, being with IBM, you know, they had locations everywhere in the world and they were fairly good at, you know, doing, doing work in, in cost-effective locations. But uh, since I started my own business, I mean, I've, I've got four different businesses nowadays and, basically the ability to hire people where both it's cost effective, but also where you can find the best people is, is so amazing, right? I mean, obviously if you live in the Bay area, you have a ton of talent around, uh, not necessarily cheap talent, but definitely a lot of talent. Uh, whereas if you're running a business in Kansas city or something, you might struggle to find people, right? And, and that ability to basically recruit anywhere is, it's very unique, but it really gives companies a, an ability to grow and, and scale much, much better. So. It does. And, and it's not just about talent because quality talent, of course, as, you're, as which is what you're getting at, lives everywhere. Yeah. And um, so even though we may have a lot of smart, talented people in the Bay Area, we don't have a lock on them and not all of them will be suited for the culture. Not all of them totally. will get along. Not all of them will have the right voice. So yeah. there's, there's many more factors than just, as you know, as I'm sure you'd agree, and then in terms of just sheer qualification. Um, yeah. Also, I think we find that people who 
people at this stage do not take working for remotely 100% of the time for granted. They really appreciate it and value it. Now humans are very good at adapting to their environment. Maybe in five years that will feel differently. But because of that, they, they value it and they understand it's also responsibility and they take it seriously. And, yeah. and it's a privilege, and if you will, to, um, if they recognize that this is not the norm. And so they're committed um, to, to getting it right, to, being, to making good judgments and handling their responsibilities carefully so that they can continue, so that we can continue this sort of grand experiment together. We make it very clear to our team that if you're not responsible with your time, this experiment we're doing is going to fail. If this company fails, we're all back to working, you know, taking jobs. Um, yeah. And so it relies on all of us to, to meet the commitments we make. And that, that seems to motivate people. Yeah, that's super exciting. Super exciting. So, so you run a consultancy company nowadays. What, what, what do you do with that? And what's, what's sort of the, the key people you help? So uh, our consultancy, we're, uh, we're going to be changing our name. Our current name is Timeshare CMO because it's how it started, which was myself working as a part-time CMO for several different companies at a time. And I rapidly, the business, it became obvious that the real need um, was to support CMOs themselves. Uh, I found that, that working um, in, an, in a location-independent way with CEOs was difficult. They really did need to have a CMO on site with them. I think there are, there are places that, you know, and I, and I do think that companies owe it to themselves to have someone who's thinking about the business full time. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to being split across cultures. And it depends on the, the size of the business and so on. But past a certain stage, certainly past Series A, um, there needs to be a full-time sort of strategic marketer. And that that person was often very lonely in the job, especially in a tech company. Again, the, the challenges I, that my clients face are, are unique to usually being tech, tech companies or being um, not just in the Bay Area, but just in that mindset that they're engineering driven. They're rarely yeah. marketing driven. And so it's a lonely job and having just someone to talk to about the decisions they're making as a thought partner, not necessarily as a coach or a cheerleader, but as a true, you know, thought partner, the CEO often can't do that. They don't have marketing background. Um, their peers don't understand what they do. And with the average tenure now of a CMO being just 27 months, the pressure is on from the beginning. And so we like to say that we help CMOs keep their jobs. We help yeah. them stay in the job longer, which has benefits, it accrues to the company as well. The longer your CMO is in the job, the more likely you are to have a successful company. Companies do not change CMOs when things are going well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think, I mean, majority of the clients that I generally work with from a coaching standpoint, right, is, is location independent businesses. Many of them probably a little bit smaller than the ones you're working with, but mm -hmm. I, I definitely see like most businesses that start out have certain benefits, right? So the founder is either marketing and sales focused or they're very tech focused or like they often have a strength, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I totally agree when, when their strength is not marketing, definitely having someone that help call the shots. And I even, even sort of fractional CMO, I, I see being, more and more popular for some of these smaller tech businesses when they start out because they, they like a lot of time with business owners, they need someone to spar with. They need someone who, they, they, they often can't afford necessarily a, a really well qualified CMO, but they really need someone, you know, with the right level of knowledge who can come in and maybe even direct some lower level staff or, or some people, even contractors actually running other things, right? Yeah, and I think, yeah, where that CMO sits, I mean, in some cases, it does make sense for them to be location independent, but generally, they've got to be in the office at that early stage is what I'm finding, even if it's only one or two days a week. It's yeah. really, it's, and that is, has been difficult for us to scale. Yeah. So I think your point is well taken. Yeah, I think, but I think it, it's still a, I think it's still a valid, like, so a lot of my clients, they are probably smaller businesses, but they tend to be more or less location independent. So very, very different from the tech companies you'll see in, in, in Which sort is of odd, a new right? area. You know, we, we sort of invented out here, you know, the idea of like, you know, communicating with strangers over the internet. And yet so many tech companies still have not embraced um, remote work, which is fascinating to me. Yeah, it is. And I, I think though, like, I think, I mean, I run an office right now, so I have an office with a lot of people in it and I have a bunch of people who are remote. Right. And I think, I, I think there's definitely a lot of situations and a lot of times where 
having that office can make a lot of sense and be really beneficial. Um, but but for, for me, it's a lot about talent and where you find them and, and, and particularly like a lot of these smaller startups, right? Like when, when you're in Silicon Valley, if you're, you know, if you're getting funding and stuff, it's a very, very different environment. If you're trying to, to kickstart your own thing, working out of a basement somewhere or whatever, like your, your finances is generally in a very different situation, right? And, and the ability to hire people, not just remotely, but literally somewhere else on the planet where, where you know, the costs are very different is, is often the, the only way to be successful, right? And that's, um, yeah, it's very interesting looking at all my clients, right? And basically seeing like so many people hire, like, you know, developers come from Eastern Europe, customer service and sort of process execution is in the Philippines. And a lot of good native stuff come out of South Africa where the, a lot of people are native English speakers, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, it's very interesting to see those dynamics and see the opportunities, right? Um, it is, and, and I guess I'm excited to hear about them. You should be doing more talking to me because uh, <laughs> we get, an, you know, we, we have a way of doing things here. And after 20 years, it's very hard for me to detach myself and see, yes. I, I can see my own limitation. Um, and so I, I'm desperate when I travel other places, I say, please don't copy us. Like, take what works and get rid of the rest. There are things we do really well here. There are things we do terribly here. And I, I, I love to hear about how people are doing the process of startups and building companies that are not in the Bay Area. Um, because this is a place that's, that is, it's its own thing. I'm not saying it's better. It's just different and it's its own unique idiosyncratic thing. Yeah. No, but and, uh, I mean, as, as an example, right? Like talking about South, South Africa, like a, a friend of mine, he literally built a, a huge agency with, about 30 employees, right? And he built it up in less than a year. And he was hiring people who have been working agency-wise and Facebook ads for for years. And he like they were they were looking for a thousand dollars a month, twelve hundred dollars a month. And they were absolutely amazing with Facebook ads, right? Mm -hmm. If you would have to hire a person like that in the Bay Area, you would pay eight, ten grand at least a month, right? At so least. well and like, I but I also think some of those days are changing, to be honest. Now I definitely. could be ahead of the, the game um, or I could be ahead of my time, if you will. I, I can't predict the timing of this, but what I do see is that that bubble, I, I think it's a bubble is going to deflate. I, I think that the days of building out, you know, fast, um, fast paced ad buying in social media is, is dying. I don't know that it'll die this year, this month. I don't want to sound, you know, alarmist or reductionist. But I think that people are starting to realize that it's not all it's cracked up to be and it's not driving business results. And it can be faked and gamed so easily that, that what we're seeing here is that at least that people are starting to come back to what I call a flight to quality, recognizing yeah. that the fundamentals are more important than ever, knowing your customer, building a great product, uh, building messaging that resonates and finding a way to deliver what custom, uh, a solution that customers really need versus sort of like pushing through um, through tricks or through growth hacks or through through advertising. It's not that advertising isn't great. You got to tell people what's there, but the, the mood is changing here. I don't know if you feel that where you are. Yeah, I would say what, what I'm seeing is that it definitely it becomes unprofitable for a lot of businesses, right? So so the business I work with generally is business looking for profit. They're not just looking for growth for the sake of it, right? But, mm -hmm. but, but generally a lot of businesses like a year ago or two years ago, Facebook ads were super profitable for them. And nowadays right. it might not be right, and that's obviously a question of supply and demand, right? Well, and also uh, dumb money has entered. I mean, very large brands sure. have come in that don't care about profit as much, because yeah. what they spend on Facebook is a drop in the bucket, and so they just they just that that has driven cost up, and so it's it's very difficult for a lot of small companies to actually um, build a profitable business simply on internet advertising. Yeah. And again, I think so. So there's still a ton of businesses that do really well. And it's either, it's usually one of three scenarios. Either they have a very specific niche product that mm -hmm. isn't particularly competitive yet. Yep. Uh, two, they have a, a very good customer lifetime value. So they might have a good brand where they have multiple products. So, you know, even, even though the first sale or two sales doesn't bring them back the money, they still make back the money within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, or three, they have sort of very expensive products that, you know, they don't need to make a lot of sales to, to make a profit and they, they are still doing pretty well in that space. So that's well stated. That's, that's exactly right. 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's basically what I see. Uh, that I would say the second thing I see is like Facebook ads have been the big thing for many many years now, right? And mm -hmm. what what I do see is there's so many other ad platforms coming out. Like when when you look at Reddit ads and I mean even YouTube ads is mm -hmm. cost wise like so cheap compared to Facebook. So there's all these other platforms that are looking at Facebook, looking at Google, and they're coming out with ads as well. And there's definitely like at least in the initial phase for a lot of these new platforms, there's a lot to be gained, right? Because you, you can get a lot of benefit from, from being on these platforms and you can get a lot of growth out of that. In the end of the day, the way I look at it is that you can get growth in so many areas. Building a brand, it's really about getting sort of the core people in, right? And, and if you can do that with PPC and you can make a profit or at least not, lose money for a period of time, that, that's a great way to get off the ground, right? Because get it, getting from zero to, you know, having enough volume to be profitable is, is important for new companies. And, and I think, I, th I still think PPC plays a big role in that game, but mm -hmm. yeah. In many ways, PPC, you know, it's funny, it's, it's more expensive, but that's because it's less likely to be gamed because Google cleaned up their act a long time ago. So Whereas Facebook, I still feel Twitter has a long way to go. Pinterest, I'm sorry, but their tracking is very difficult. Like we'd love, yeah. we would have loved to do more advertising on there, but the APIs have made the analytics almost impossible. It drives our analysts crazy when we when people advertise there because we can't get enough information. So definitely. it's um yeah, I mean more to come, but I think at scale, I th I think you're you're definitely onto something. I, I guess what I was trying to say was I feel that a lot of a lot. That's a, that's an overstatement. There was definitely a segment of CMOs who, because of the pressure that they were under to perform and the sort of conflict between engineering and marketing, I think probably were justifying their positions with social media metrics because that's what the craze was. That's And it was everybody. It wasn't just them. It's what there's, you know, engineering driven CEOs want to see numbers and social media could give you numbers. You know, banner ads can't really give you numbers, real numbers of conversions and television can't give you numbers and neither can print or trade shows or other things that are harder to track, but can often have lasting brand value if done properly. Yeah. So, so by and large, it's a mixed problem and, and marketers are transitioning all these efforts into social media. But in the end, if they're not investing in, and this is my message is really for CEOs, not CMOs. If, if you're not investing in these sort of untrackable things, you are not building a brand. If you're not investing in messaging, if you're not investing in experiences, if you're not investing in your product and, and your customer relationships in this life cycle, as you just referred to, ultimately you, you can't sustain whatever growth you're putting in motion. And, and quality content. I mean, I, I, I still like, again, I see so many people who build some random e-commerce store and suddenly starts firing off ads, right? And mm -hmm. I'm like, they've, they've nothing on their website worth reading. So that's right. like, like, uh, and conversely, if, if, I've seen people build, build communities and markets around content marketing and then launch incredible businesses. Yeah. Likewise. And, and that's, uh, and that's the, that's a great way when, when you see that happens. I mean, it's amazing. And I, I see a ton of people and, and even a lot of the clients I work with is, is in that space, right? Like they build the community, they, they share amazing knowledge and, you know, then they launch a business on the back of that. And, and it's so much nicer to see than the other way around when people launch the business and then desperately trying to add, add, pick I up mean, customers I'm, everywhere. The best book I've read in the last probably 10 years about marketing, well, there's two actually. One is The Challenger Sale, which I think if you're a B2B marketer, it's required reading. But the, but in the, last, you know, in the last year, my favorite all-around marketing book is Seth Godin's book called This Is Marketing. It's a slim little book. It is deeply profound. Um, maybe it's because I'm reading it at this sort of advanced stage in my career where what he's talking about resonates with me. But yeah. it, it, he so clearly and concisely talks about how, what marketing is, and really what marketing is, is about change. When, yeah. you, when we market something, we're asking somebody to change. We're asking the consumer to make a change in what they buy. We're asking business to business to take a risk. But marketing is all about change. And the status quo, as he says, does not change just because we're right or just because we have a better product. It's not yes. enough. If truth were enough to change the status quo, the status quo would have changed a long time ago. So the question is, what is it about the, about the people that you seek to serve? How well do you understand the people you seek to serve and match what you say and who you are to what 
what they really believe, it, which is really basic stuff. It never gets old because this is humans we're talking about here, not slot machines. They can't, yeah. they're not computers. They can't be programmed. It's not like if I put in X dollars, X dollars will come out. That's just not, not what a brand is. Um, and so it's funny, even though I built my career as an analytic marketer, an expert in web analytics and how to, how to understand and justify yourself with them. And my heart, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in, in the power of brand. They have to work together. Definitely, definitely. Very interesting, very interesting. So Melinda, to go back a little bit more to the sort of management angle of things, what, what, what's the biggest management challenge you've ever faced in, in any of your businesses or any of the jobs you've worked in? Mm. And how did you overcome it? Well, I think it's funny you're going to say this. I think management challenges are unique to each person. Mm -hmm. So I, I often say that owning your own company is an exercise in sort of apologizing. Like you are going to see your entire self reflected back at you. Your company is a manifestation of who you are. You cannot help it. Yeah. Um, and so mistakes that you make, you're just going to see them <laughs> in like 30 foot high letters. It's like, oh, wow, I did that. Like, so yes. my mistakes are not going to be other people's mistakes. Um, they're going to be related to who I am as a person, um, what challenges I have to grow as a person. And so my biggest mistakes are the ones related to um, taking too long to, um, to deal with performance issues and to confront issues. And it stems directly from my own experience as a woman in technology who felt that I was um, criticized in ways that were not appropriate, that were yeah. personality-based and not performance-based, all the stuff we read about in the media. I had very difficult managers, not all, I had, but I had some managers that were very um, challenging, that were threatening, that were aggressive, that sort of damaged me. And I went too far in the other direction. I was yeah. too nice. And that's just as much of a problem as, as not being nice enough. Um, and you learn as much from the bad managers as you do from the good. And so it took me a while to grab on to this idea that the company is what matters first and foremost. Yeah. And I want to care for my people as much as I can. But at the moment at which that caring conflicts with the health of the business, it's, that's not going to work. The business has to come first. So totally. I, can, I, can, I can support and I can nurture and I can bring someone along only as far as I see that what they're doing ultimately have be detrimental to the company. And then, they, then that has to change. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that a lot. And I, I think a lot of people live through that, right? Like some people just naturally are, let's call it too nice people, if you will. Uh, uh, whereas others, exactly as you said, have had experiences. And uh, very often what, what I see is someone have a great experience doing something and because it worked once, they think it will always work, right? So they hire this person who, you know, were doing crap and, and you know, they, they managed to turn them around and they're like, okay, every time someone do bad, I'll just, I'll, I'll keep working with them and I'll turn them around eventually. Uh, and you know, that, that can be a very, very difficult mindset, right? So uh, I totally say, like the way you look at it, yeah. And it's changing. So the, the management challenge I had in the first year of the company is not the management challenge I have this year. Yeah. The management totally. challenge I had in the first year of the company was getting the company off the ground, like finding people. Yeah. And the management challenge I have this year is how to level up my team. So in order for this business to grow and be a value, whether it's for acquisition or whether it's for long-term profitability, it's how do I take the people around me and make them and center them and make them experts. So it's not just the Melinda company. Yeah. And so that's a different, that's a different challenge. I have the right people in place now. It's about, you know, pushing, nurturing, encouraging, <laughs> you know, cajoling, shoving, you know, them to get out and do podcasts and to build their reputations and to take more chances and to grow um, publicly so that they can be just as much the face of this company as I can. And they totally have it within them. Um, so the, the big post-it note I have on my desk this year is stop adding too much value. Stop, you know, shut your mouth, like basically, because you want to help, you want, and answering it for them doesn't help them. It's really, um, I read a great book at the beginning of last year called The Coaching Habit, also highly recommend it, super tactical, and it's about asking questions and helping people learn to coach themselves so that you're not being pulled, you're not basically having all the work delegated to you by solving all the problems. It's teaching people how to solve their own problems. Uh, that, that is one of the key things I focus on a lot in my coaching. So one of, one of the things I tend to say is never answer questions. Yep. And, and what I mean with that is 
never answer questions. <laughs> really, um, like, but, or answer them with a question, which is tell me, you know, what is your biggest challenge here? And what is your but, biggest challenge? And what else? And what else, you know? The, the problem is as a business owner, you're generally the expert because that's how your business started, right? You, usually your business starts around you. Uh, the, the one thing that rarely works is uh, what, what happens is as a business grow, the, the problem is you keep answering the questions, mm -hmm. which means you keep being the expert because you're always making the choices. Mm -hmm. And the challenge that happens is when you answer questions, people don't think as much. Correct. So they don't think about what is the option, what is everything, right? So basically the, the, the way I look at it is you should only ever answer a question with a question. So if someone comes to you and says, you know, I don't know, this customer wants a refund, what should I do? And your question should be, well, what are the options that you see? Or I say, what do you think? I actually say, I, I say, what do you want to do? What do you think you should do? Yeah. I teach them to come with the answer. And they say, well, I plan to do X. And I say, go with God. Like, like do it. Like, what I have said to them is, if I'm not making the decision, that's a win. That's the goal here. And, and what I want them to be doing is making decisions in their sphere, right? In their defined sphere. We'll get to that in a moment because I spent a lot of time this year helping define specific behaviors and spheres. But in what I say is when it's in your sphere of decision-making, the choice is yours. And the only reason I want you escalating to me is obviously if it's a conflict of value, right? We have certain values in our company. And if yeah. what you're seeing is a conflict of value, that is a partner level escalation. You know, if it's, it's about judgment and things like that. We sure. want to be in right now. We're still very, very small and we want to be heavily involved in decisions around judgment, which have to do essentially with money, with people and with sort of client problems If a client is a problem or escalation. Yeah. But beyond that, in the tactical work, you just have to accept as a leader, they're not going to do it how you did it. And if you didn't and if you don't trust them, you hired the wrong people and that's on you. Yeah. Straight up. I have no other answer for it other than that. You got to get the right because I, I, can, I can feel the difference this year versus say in the early days. Now that I, I have this team around me that's just rock solid. Like their judgment yeah. is excellent. They prove it over and over and over again. So I don't need to be involved in the decision making. That frees me up to do the things I only I can do and that I'm supposed to be doing. And, and that's exactly the point, right? So, so normally when I ask them, I ask them two questions. So the first one is, you know, what are the options that you see available? And I do that a lot, particularly when people join the company, because what I'm very aware of is that, you know, it's easy to think that everyone else knows what, what you know, mm -hmm. right? Particularly when you're a business owner. So I, I really like to understand their level of thinking and where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Because if, if they just come to me and say, hey, here's the problem and this is what I want to do. Um, if I don't understand how they get to that decision, then sometimes I can make some bad choices, right? Um, Fair enough. I think what I assume is that to, I'm, I'm, you're making me think about why I do what I do. And I think the yeah. reason I do what I do is usually if they say what they're going to do and it agrees with what I would probably do, I generally say yes. Unless, and, and even if I don't agree, I think about the stakes. So exactly. I think about like, okay, is this a decision that's going to change the world or change or materially impact the business? No. Do I want to spend the time thinking about every single decision? No, I don't either. And so that's, so my, my, this is me. I'm not saying you're wrong yeah. and I'm right or either or, but oh. the way I think about this is, is to sort of quickly in my mind go, is that how important is this? If yeah. this is not important and the decision is different from what I would do, I'm so focused right now on teaching them independence that I lean towards independence. And I yeah. lean, and if the mistake is not, you know, fatal, if, if, if the decision, and I won't let them do something wrong if I know it's wrong. I mean, that's, that's crazy. But if it's unclear or if, or if to find out what the answer would be would take more time than I want to spend, I say, let them go with it because people can learn as much from their mistakes as they can from their successes. And so yes. I'm willing to let them fall in a, in controlled ways. Like you might do with a child, right? First they have training wheels and then they, you know, and, and the level of decision-making that they're granted is was in these spheres, which we could talk about such that I feel comfortable that if they fail there, it's not fatal yeah. for them either, because sometimes people don't do very well in their fail. And that's a another conversation we could get into is really have to assess the comfort level of your team some are more risk takers than others. The ones that are not, not risk takers need to be reassured and need to have their, their, their confidence built up. 
Definitely. And, and you, you'll definitely have people that ask a million questions and you have people that ask nothing, right? So, so totally yeah. agree. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the key thing that I've always found is that um, I, I, I definitely, a lot of the time what I've learned is even though I think I know the right answer, I might not always be right. So it's also Amazing easy, that how that works, right? <laughs> easy as a business owner to think you always know the right answer. So I, I, I totally make exactly the same assessment as you and I'm like, is this going to break the company? And, and sometimes even if I think it's the wrong choice, I won't necessarily tell them. But what I'm very keen on is I'm very keen on the thinking that yeah. brings them to make the decision. That's because a good point. If, I could under I could I could emphasize that more. That's if, good. That's good advice. If, if they don't understand, like if, if they're making a decision because there's something they fundamentally misunderstand, then I'm very keen on spending the time helping them understand something in a different way. Uh, whereas if they're making what I would call the wrong decision or what they're making a decision that I wouldn't make, or I would make a different one, but they understand the concept, they just have a different opinion, mm -hmm. then generally I would always let them run with it, right? But I find it very important to, to sort of develop my staff to make sure that I understand how they get to a decision if, if they're thinking it through, right? Because it also makes it so much easier for me to say, well, you know, every time you come and ask me a question, you know the answer, like, just do it, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's good feedback. I think, as I think about, you know, I, also it's hard, I'll have to chew on that because the people around me now I've had for so long that there's a lot of trust. Um, yeah. But as we bring new people on, it's also good coaching for the team as, because now they're learning to coach. Yeah. And I, hit, I spent a lot of effort on this core team because as, I, as all the data shows, the first five people you hire are your company. Your yeah. culture is set. By the time you hire employee number five, it has been proven to be very difficult to change that culture. Yep. And so as each person was brought on, I had the same talk with them about the importance of you being one of the five. You are one of the five. You will be critically important to building the kind of company we want to build um, yeah. and having a voice in that. And so I'm going to be really hard on you. I warned them, like, I'm going to be very in intense with you in these early days because I have to make sure that we've got the right people around us. Now it's like, it's, I can't, I cannot, I can't believe, like, it's just amazing to watch it grow and watch them make decisions. Like, you're like, they make better decisions than I do. They're smarter and better than I was at their age. It's, it's astonishing to watch. It's gratifying. So it's not easy. It takes a lot of time. I call it an investment. You have to invest in your people. Your time is just as much an investment as your money. And, and, but my gosh, the rewards are, they're just unbelievable. Yeah. And I, I love the way you, you, you were thinking about that because I think, uh, I think so many business owners are like, again, in the beginning, they're often focused too much on you know, finding the right person. Um, but I think a lot of the time, like you want to find great people 100%, but instead of necessarily paying through the nose for expensive people with a lot of experience, I've always built companies with finding people who are really eager and really driven. Yes but might not have the experience. They might I call it not growing be your own. Growing your it, own is, it's more fun. I mean, it's also you grow together and they grow together. Like the yeah. challenge this year I, I put in front of them in mid year was here are things that as, so as the business owner, I have to sell more straight up. You have to spend, you know, basic research says you gotta be spending a solid 50% of your time in business development. In order to do that, here are X tasks that I have to stop doing. Yeah. Now there are four of you and here's what I think. This is my best guess at a straw man about how I might divide these. But I want the four of you to congregate and decide amongst yourselves who will take on. And I also said, like, these are the important things and these are the things that we can get to. Like, you don't have to start doing all this work all at once. But, like, you know, some of you are going to need some growth in order to sort of grow into the role. But by and large, it blew me away when they met in one meeting and they subdivided everything and they had the tasks and they were off and running in one hour after like literally at one meeting after I wrote this letter, um, I called it like my Warren Buffett letter at five years. Like, what do I think about the company and what do I need at five years? And they went, they went for it. Yeah. And this goes back to the idea of having found amazing people. The, I, I think you can teach skills. You cannot teach character. You cannot teach. And people talk about motivation. I don't want to get into the whole, like I, I don't buy into that whole 10 X engineer nonsense or this idea of like, it's not about being aggressive, but it's about being, taking pride in your work. 
and being yeah. somebody people can count on. And if you take pride in your work and you're reliable and trustworthy, um, there's a lot, and you have, you know, basic set of, you know, horsepower, there's a lot that can be done with that. Yeah. And I, I think for me, one of the things, like a couple of the things I'm very keen on is looking at people's expectations, because I think I've, I've found that a lot of great people resume and, and skills wise, they, they often end up with, with, wrong expectations and uh, not wrong expectations that's the wrong way to say it but they end up with expectations that doesn't align too well with me uh, and very often because again when you have already had a high paying job moving into a lesser paid job is very difficult right yes uh, even though a lot of people want to start even if they want to start their own business like when you've been used to a certain income level it, it's really difficult for people to adjust right mm -hmm. and, and i've always found it much much more interesting to work with people that that probably start below the income level that they're comfortable with. Um, like, sorry, that was wrong English. I'm not native English, obviously. Uh, they start below, uh, like they, they make good money, so they're, they're very comfortable what they're making, but they still have a huge room to grow, right? Uh, and I think that that have been pretty, pretty consistent throughout my business success that, you know, finding these people that might not have the education who might not have the, you know, the right, I don't know, parents or the right background or the right corporate jobs. But, you know, when you give them the opportunity, they're so eager to go, like they will do what it takes to figure it out and they will find ways to make things happen. Right. And, and I, I personally find so much pleasure in working with people like that rather than people who come with a, Howard degree and you know they're oh well I don't work for less than 800 bucks an hour and, that, and, it's, that and it's interesting because we have amazing people who work with us on a part-time basis who have those types of backgrounds sometimes yeah. they're advisors so for example we have if we're doing paid search for example that's a very specific skill set and we have uh, an advisor is the best way to describe it but they're paid they have full-time jobs running enormous paid search budgets at companies whose names you'd recognize. But because they love our environment and it doesn't conflict with their job, they can give us a couple of hours a week to answer questions that would ordinarily take us hours to yeah. find answers to. And they become part of the network as well. And what we hear from them over time, and we have people who have big jobs who work for us for very little money relative to what they could earn on the open market. Yeah. And the reasons that they tell us they do it are, one, it's fun. It's fun. They love it. Two, we pay on time. It's a simple thing, but we pay every two weeks on time. And many agencies don't do that. So people, when they need money, they're like, they're honest and, we, and they do the job. And three, it's no hassle and no, no politics. It's like, you mean all I have to do is like do the job and get, and I get paid on time? Like the, they're, they're insanely happy and they like the other people that they're working with. They, they think it's fun. And so that is, you know, I, I, we've had people work for us I, and I had to, I had to go meet with one of them and go, really, I've got to understand why you're willing to work for us at this price. Like, what is the deal? And yeah. the person said, I just want to learn this stuff and nobody will teach it to me. A lot of young people are not getting the training that they need. They're being slotted into a box and they want to learn something and they can't learn it. So they're willing to work for less. That person has come to me and said, I never thought I could be work for a remote company and now I can't wait. And, and to, to be fair, like we started our company, we worked with a lot of people as contractors. We tried to do everything ethically and by the law, um, yeah. but we hire first from people who have worked for us as contractors because we learn so much about people that way. And there's, there, as you go, there's a perfect example of being willing to work for a little bit less. Yeah. You know, they all started with us part time. So by the time it was time to hire, it was obvious, you know, by the time we, we felt stable enough and they understood why, forgive me for going on, but this is an important, this is to me a really important point yeah. is that I was very clear with folks. I didn't want to build Uber for marketing. That was, I didn't want to build a gig economy company. That wasn't where I was at. But the fact is that agency life is lumpy. That's a, that's a fact. Revenue, agency revenue is lumpy. And one of the things I learned was that agencies will overhire when they get one big client and then they're out of business or they have to lay people off six months later. And I felt that was incredibly unfair to young people, in particular yeah. young people. So what I said to them was, is this is an uncertain environment. I'd rather be honest with you about that. I'd rather tell you where we are and not hire you full time until I feel comfortable that we can employ you for at least two years. Yeah. Because it looks bad to work for a company and have them go out of business, like especially as a young person who have never heard of them. Why, you know, why should I hire you? It's a no-name company. See what I'm saying? 
So I'm proud to say that we are five years in and sort of, you know, knock on wood, this is me tapping on my head, knock on wood. Um, We've had almost no turnover. Literally, we had one person leave. And that's because they went to a very big job that they should go on to. Like it was a big, big promotion for them at a big brand name company. It was a job we wanted them to have. Um, But that's it. Literally everyone else that has come to us has stayed with us. I think that's, that says a lot about how we're handling it. Definitely. And that's, uh, and that's great management as well. I mean, I, I think when I work corporate with IBM and so on, one of, one of my biggest metrics to, to my managers was, was really looking at like, what, what is your attrition like? Mm-hmm. And more importantly, how far in advance do you know when people are planning to yes. leave? Yes. Right. Do com- people leave people, not companies. They leave managers, not companies. Exactly. And, and I, I've like one of my big things have always been having great relationship with people. Right. Because if you have and, and, and people always say, like, does that mean you need to be friends with everyone? And it's like, no, no that's not at all what it's about. But it means if you if you can build a strong relationship with, with the people in your team, if they trust you and you're being honest with them, they, they will go that extra mile for you. They will, they will do the things that, you know, makes a big difference in the longer term. And, and fundamentally, like, it, it's not necessarily, you know, I used the example of, you know, you leave five past five instead of five because there's an email that still needs to be answered or something. That That's the small things, but it's the things that makes a big difference in the long run, right? And and if people love working there, it, it just, it's a totally different atmosphere and it's a totally different feeling for them and that's what you want to create and and to add to that i I agree with you in theory what i see happening in in the bay area is that a lot of managers turn this into like well if i the equivalent of foosball tables like you know or ping pong or beer fridays and it's not again about being friendly i think you know we have none of those things we're a remote first company but what we give people is training we give them autonomy if you want to go get a haircut in the middle of the day nobody cares like yeah. make your deadlines. Like it's, it's, it's literally about treating people like grownups, treating them fairly. I think yeah. the more you infantilize, the more you treat them like children, the more they'll behave like children, the more you put control in their hands, the more they'll, they'll rise to it. And again, if not, you have the wrong people. Yep. And so it's, it's, it's amazing. Like they work hard when they're supposed to work hard. And we don't, generally, we do not work nights and weekends. We have a stated plan that on Slack, the default is asynchronous unless you are marked, unless you mark yourself as being present. So you should assume that responses in, in Slack will be asynchronous unless it's clear that the person's online. And what a difference that makes. People log off and they rest at night. So when they come into work the next day, they're not angry. They're not fighting with each other. They're with their families on the weekends. You know, some work different hours. Some have families, so they want to work on the weekends. You know, they'll work at nights during the week. And then, you know, different people have different things. But by and large, people are keeping the schedules that are healthy for them. And that creates a healthy culture. So what you're saying is that your team is not hustling 25 hours a day. I'm not hustling 25 hours a day. I know this blows people away, but I don't (laughs) generally work more than 40 hours a week on average obviously there are weeks i work 50 obviously and that there are weeks i work less sure. i believe in the in the reversion to mean when you work more than 50 hours a week you are only borrowing from the following week and eventually you are you will revert to the mean yeah. and you'll you can't work at all because you're burned out and the average is still the same yeah so, no, actually so i've 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 seen so many interesting studies in, in Sweden and Denmark where I'm from and where where i basically see that they're, they're cutting work weeks down from uh, 40 to 30 hours and they're actually seeing better results and higher productivity overall with less working hours. This is my theory. Nobody who works in an office wants to hear it from me, but it's my theory that a lot of time in offices is wasted. And, and it is, right? But, but I think it's, it's really eye-opening. And I think it also depends a lot about personalities, right? Because I, I definitely know of people who can do a lot more work in 10 hours than, than I can. But, but I think for a lot of people, you, you both need the breaks and, and it doesn't matter if you're a business owner or an individual contributor, but, mm-hmm. but you know, some, some people have a lot more drive. And I think if you look at people like 
Elon Musk as a famous example. Like he, he's probably one of those few people in the world who can schedule in 35 minutes a day with his kids. But uh, his, I, I think his ability and drive to achieve things through utilizing significantly more time is, I, I believe that he could probably not do that if he had worked a normal work day. But I think he is much more the exception than the rule. And he probably have a drive that that isn't normal for, well, for most human and, beings. And how, what kind of a company is, I mean, you know, given what we read in the press about what are the working conditions like at Tesla? What are yeah. the working conditions like there for people? What is the legacy you want to leave on earth? Is it just about how much money you make? Or is it just, is it, is it, is it something else? You know, I won't even well, speculate what that else could be, but that's, you know, like you said, I think he's an exception. He's an outlier. And when I think about the turnover in agencies, when I think all the people of the people that started being a consultant at the same time I did, how many of them gave up and left and now work in companies and yeah. I'm still here and I'm still going and I haven't burned out. And I'm, and a lot of people burn out. Consulting is one of those things that will burn you out because you give You're a giver. So you're giving to your clients, you're serving and we close our office for a week every year at Christmas. This year was because of the way Christmas and New Year's were set up. We actually closed for almost 12 days. Um, we, we give people time off and I take two weeks a year. I know a lot of founders think I'm crazy. I take two weeks a year where I do not answer the phone. I do not. It was a great management exercise in the early days. I sure learned what my people didn't know um, in, in those two weeks when I came back. But they also blew me with, away with what they could do. And it's when I take that time off, I come back refreshed and ready to work. And I don't. I, I think even Elon Musk needs a vacation. Um, Definitely. You're, you're cl- Definitely. The clarity of thinking that you can offer when you actually rest, um, I think that's also been proven too. Definitely. Definitely. And I, I think so. A lot of good points you just made. So I think uh, I. I mean, you, you're saying two weeks vacation and when you're coming from Europe and we have yeah, five, you're like, six, two weeks, <laughs> two, two weeks, that sounds like a horrible year. So, uh, um, but, but, but I mean, but I also I think, like took, I took 12 days off at Christmas roughly. I mean, I was kind of monitoring, but things were very quiet and I take sure. a couple of long weekends. So maybe I get the same amount of time or so that yeah. it's just broke. It's just less about having a whole month off at one time. We're sure. a small company, so it's hard to be gone for that long, but I'm getting yeah. there. I think I could easily be gone three weeks now and maybe four in the, in the next couple of years and have the right team to run it. And our team uh, is a lot given the same latitude. They tend not to take more than two weeks at a time again, because we're small, but they'll uh, take, they'll do the same thing. It's not just me. It's them too, because I believe that service, it drains you. And yeah. people need time to sort of recharge their batteries and get creative. Clients pay us to be creative. You cannot be creative. That's the one thing I know. That I don't care if you're Elon Musk or not. You you do not get your best ideas when you're exhausted. That's probably that's probably true. I mean, I so one of the things I've found when I when I was working uh, corporate was I I am generally a shitty salesperson. <laughs> but one one thing I did find is when when I'm really tired. I get a little bit better at it because my, uh, I don't know, I'm just a little bit less impatient or whatever. And uh, I, I generally perform better in sales type work when, when I'm a little bit tired and that was kind of horrible to find out. But, uh, but, but generally, I mean, good rest is, is essential. I get my uh, best ideas when I'm reading or doing something completely unrelated to my work. When I have time to read a book that has nothing to do with work. I find creative ideas coming to me when I'm on that cruise about a week in, like the first week, it's like, yeehaw, I'm not working. Yeah. And then about seven, 10 days in, I start to get amazing ideas. I start to think about, well, what do I want to change? And I start to d- develop like, what, how do I want to tackle this? And I start to have the energy to deal with it could, again, I think everybody's psychology is different and we don't talk enough. There won't be enough time in this podcast to talk about how sure. people are different and how different people need different structures. I think most people do work in waves. You know, they work in, I tend to like to work in, in really focused, concentrated weeks and then, and then slack off a little. And most business is not set up that way. So yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating conversation and everybody's different and worked. One of the nice things about remote work, I think, is that it can start to accommodate the fact that people are different. Definitely. Definitely. Right. Uh, Melinda, it has been an amazing conversation with you. Uh, Super fun to have you on here. Uh, if people are eager to get in touch with you, what's the best place to, to get hold of you? 
We can certainly find me at Timeshare CMO. I'm Melinda at Timeshare CMO. I also, if you don't mind, um, I'm going to plug my own podcast, which is a different kind of podcast. It's the only first-person oral history of Silicon Valley. So I interview, one of the fun parts about living in Silicon Valley is I get to have conversations with people that are pretty, that you might only hear about on the news. So if you're interested in sort of long form, sort of, you know, good conversations, it's a lot like this, actually. It's very conversational, very long form, very much about, I do less talking and more listening to people, um, but you might like that. And that's staying alive in tech. So it's stay in without the G, like just like the BG song, staying alive in tech.com. Um, and so you can find me there. I'm also very active on Twitter. Um, although, you know, depending on your political views, you may or may not like that. Um, but it might, a lot of my business stuff is on LinkedIn, of course. And so I'd be happy to engage with your listeners. And, and thank you for challenging me. I've got, I've got some tasks I have to do. Excellent. Sounds great. Thank you very much for coming here and uh, have a great day, Melon. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Please leave a review. It means the world to us. You can also learn more about management at madsingers.com.